Welcome to Woodbury Rights Podcast. I'm Sandy Carlson, your host, and I am with Ann K. Howard. Ann has been a practicing attorney for 20 years, including two years as a judicial decision writer for the federal government. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in English Literature from McGill University in Montreal, Quebec, and a law degree from the University of Cincinnati College of Law. In addition to writing Escape from Mariupol, a survivor's true story with Adoriana Merrick, Howard has also written His Garden, Conversations with a Serial Killer. She wrote The Ghost in Her, book one in the Ungilded series under the pen name Annika Savoy. Welcome, Anne. Thank you for joining us today to talk about your writing career. Thank you, Sandy. Thanks for having me. I'm really looking forward to our chat. Me too. So you... You've written a book about uh, a young woman who got out of Mariupol during Russia's unprovoked attack on that, uh, the country of Ukraine most recently. And you've written about serial killers. So you, you dig deep into the, the harder aspects of life. And that's, that's fascinating. Would you tell us about yourself as a, as a writer? You know, it's, it's crazy how many genres I enjoy. You know, I enjoy uh, all types of fiction, women's fiction. I enjoy uh, horror, uh, science fiction, and nonfiction. And so, you know, I'm kind of a prolific reader ever since I was a kid. And I think that's why I kind of dip into different genres, you know, paranormal historical romance, nonfiction, um, because I, I feel that a, a, a good story is a good story. And uh, so, you know, in the true crime I wrote about the serial killer I got to know, um, you know, I was writing about one man's evil and uh, questioning what is the source of that evil? Where did it come from? Why does it exist? And, uh, you know, just trying to describe the ramifications of that evil on society at large, but also especially on his victims and their families. So when I shifted over to writing about the war in Ukraine, it seems like a big, you know, disparity between the two books. But again, once again, with Escape from Mariupol, I am exploring the question of human evil. And in this case, uh, it involves crimes against humanity. And, um, you know, I'm trying to kind of understand what is this poison in mankind, in humankind, I should say, um, that gets so out of control and can cause so much destruction and pain. And, and how do we keep this evil in check and keep the poison from spreading in, in our hearts and, and in society at large? And I, I found in reading Escape from Mariupol, which I could not put down, that a good piece of what impelled me forward uh, was the integrity of the main character, uh, Doriana's honest look at life and the people around her and her wide open eyes and her, her will to live. Um, is that what drives you forward with the writing? Is that what keeps you positive or afloat? while you explore human evil? Yes, in that case, absolutely. Because I, I, you know, as I told you previously, I wrote this book in six months, um, but I shouldn't just say I wrote it. She wrote it with me. It is her story. I would never have had this book if it weren't for her narrative voice. And you're, you're catching something that, that I, I really am glad that you saw. I hope other readers see it, is that um, the clarity of her narrative is like, crystal it's it's so crisp um and you know she lives with me now um my husband and i sponsored her and her dog to come live with us in connecticut and oh boy do i see that strong-willed survivor every day on a daily basis um she looks at life in such an honest manner i mean she does not have any pretenses or put on a veil like we all tend to do when we want to project ourselves as being a certain way. I mean, what you see is what you get. And um, I, I think that's what really prompted me to ask her when we first started emailing once she arrived at a hostel in the Czech Republic, a refugee hostel. I think what prompted me after reading a few of her emails was that very integrity of her voice, the outrage, the pain, um, the, you get the sense that 
that she's fragile and yet she's so strong. And, and when I, I read that energy came through her emails. And so when I asked her if we could write a book about it, and she readily agreed. That's why the book came out so fast. It was because she told me the story. I simply transcribed it. Then I filled in the gaps with research, with background information, follow-up questions. Tell me about your childhood, your your favorite foods, your you know things like that. So I filled in the gaps, but the skeletal framework of the story is one hundred percent her voice. And it it is truly a, a voice of integrity and, and strength. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I would just add this for our listeners that the footnotes that you add, uh, where you brought in reporting or what have you, that they're very findable resources. They're not heavy academic, uh, incomprehensible footnotes, but resources that will take you back to the news story and remind you of just what this war has been like for the people of Ukraine uh, since last February. Um, and it's, it's an important story. And I think, you know, when she encounters people who are Ukrainian people who are maybe working an advantage if they can get it, what I, what I found really heartening was she just saw for what it was and kept going. It wasn't, um, mm -hmm. you, you know, I, I think in our culture, we have a tendency, you're all good or you're all bad. Yes. And we, we keep you or we omit you, but to recognize that war strains our characters and um, yes. brings out very different things. And that the complexity of that comes through in the writing and yes um i think that you know we have this idea that 100 percent of ukrainians are on board with this war and the reality is if you grew up in uh, a part of ukraine like Mariupol, where there was a large russian population or there were a lot of uh kind of mixed marriages russian and ukrainian whatnot um there are some people in Ukraine, and in, in one part of the story, she calls them the rats, the rats, who were working undercover to assist the Russian army before the invasion of Mariupol, which is one of the many reasons why Mariupol as a city was so vulnerable and why Putin chose that city, its resources, its ocean. Um, he chose that city to bomb first because he knew that there was a large population that really didn't care either way about democracy in Ukraine. What Adoriana represents for me is the new generation of Ukrainians um, that never lived under communism. So we need to remember that there are a lot of people, especially in the Eastern and Northern Russian occupied territories who grew up under communism. You know, I mean, the Soviet Union didn't fall until 1990, and that was the year that Adoriana was born. So, you know, she's surrounded by many people who maybe they didn't grow up under communism, but their parents did. So they're influenced by their parents' political beliefs, just like in America, right? right. Um, but she, you know, her parents are notably apolitical people. Her father's Russian, her mother's Ukrainian. They've always lived in Ukraine. Um, so she didn't get any of her determination and belief in the importance of a Ukrainian democracy from her family. She got it from her peers and from her own way of thinking. She's a very independent minded, stubborn young woman. And uh, our virtues are our vices because it was that very stubbornness and that very loyalty to the new Ukraine, the post-communist era Ukraine, that kept her going through what I think all of us wonder, could I have ever gotten through it? I don't know if I could have, especially at my age. I don't think I, I don't know if I could have survived, but she had something in her that, that belief in democracy and a free Ukraine that kept her going. It's it's amazing, and I, I think just as for readers who might feel like uh, they're not into politics, they're not into current events. Mm -hmm. I, I think this book is so accessible um, because it is so human that it, yeah. it makes it it makes sense of the situation in a way that that is speaks to us as human beings. Yeah, and it's not 
not that politics. Yeah, you know, Sandy, I've always said this, that I consider myself a successful writer if the waitress at the pancake house reads my book on her breaks, if, you know, the dentist reads my book, but guess what? His, his secretary is reading the book. His patients are reading the book. I mean, like you said, it's not an academic book. Uh, and the research is in real time. So that was also interesting to try to go to, you know, yahoo.com and Reuters and, you know, Ukrainian sites to get fresh living information. So the book reads like um, a little bit like um, a news broadcast broadcast you know it's not all highfalutin <laughs> yeah no it's it's great what is uh what's ahead for you with this book is there a way to reach a broader audience with this narrative oh i hope so fingers crossed um i sent out uh queries through a, uh, a website i found called script mailer and what you what they do is for i don't know 70 bucks something like that they send out your query letter to over 400 film producers, um, Hollywood agents, whatnot. I'm not looking for a film agent because my publisher, Wild Blue Press, has a very reputable film and literary agent who has offered to assist me if this goes to the big screen. But I am looking for a film producer. So I had a couple film producers contact me and they were interested in doing a short film. You know, and that's the kind of thing that's at the film festivals, but not necessarily, you know, available to the wider population. Um, so I just kind of gave up hope with that. And then five months after I send out these queries, a Netflix producer, a guy who's done some beautiful film work on Netflix, contacted me. And he asked if I had a script or a detailed film synopsis. So I, I just went to the library and spent seven hours typing my brains out, quickly writing a film synopsis. Uh, and I sent it to him. And that was about three weeks ago. So I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Um, I would love to have this either made into a feature film or, you know, a six-part Netflix series or something like that. What the film agent at Wild Blue to told me is that nowadays, you know, you know, someone like Sylvester Stallone wrote the Rocky screen screenplay script, which I recently read and it's fabulous. It's so fabulous. But, you know, he pitched it to producers and then they accepted it and, and, and went forward with the film. But according to this film agent, it doesn't usually happen like that anymore because it's so damn competitive. And unfortunately or fortunately, places like Netflix have their own teams of script writers. So you pitch the synopsis. Now I'm currently working on a more detailed film treatment, which is the middle ground between a film synopsis and a screenplay. So I'm going to hopefully send them that treatment within the next few months. I hope I get lucky, but it seems to me like in Hollywood, so much depends on luck you know, getting the right person at the right time. Uh, I don't know how the writer's strike is going to uh, affect it. So we'll, we'll see. I just, I believe kind of in the powers of the universe. And that's another thing that really excited me when I got to know Adoriana through email was that we're totally on the same page with our view of the synchronicity of things. And, and how things can get just, if you think and have that intention and, and you give it your best effort, you know, the universe will honor you and give you what you need. So fingers crossed, something good will happen with that, with that film producer. My fingers are crossed for you. I, I just think it's a great story and they'd be crazy to pass it up. Let's just say that. <laughs> Thank you. I think it, it, tra it translates so well to movie because as I wrote it, I was seeing it as a film, but it's, it's got the perfect arc for a movie where you have the character who is presented with an obstacle and you describe the obstacle and how does she overcome the obstacle. So it's the perfect movie arc. And not only that, but it's full of action, action, action. And, you know, so I, I can see it as a movie. Yeah. Yeah. It's the hero's journey archetype and there's a dog. How can you lose with a dog, you know? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And 
you know, I love that Yola, the dog, uh, Siberian Husky in the book, she currently lives with us. She is a remarkable dog. We just took her to a dog parade in Norfolk and she won judge's favorite best in show. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Yes. So, she's a winner. She's winning yeah. at life. <laughs> That's terrific. And can we just shift gears a little bit? And can you just talk a little bit in more detail about some of your your influence as a writer? I mean, um, who's your favorite author? What do you read? If you could look at all the authors I like the best, I'd say about two thirds of them are men. And I don't know why that is. Um, I like a lot of male nonfiction writers uh, for true crime. I love uh, Joe McGinnis, Truman Capote. Um, I love John Krakauer. Um, let's see, who else? And then I, I love some female writers like Ann Tyler. I think she is a real wordsmith. Um, Anita Shreve. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I was asked, what's my favorite book of all time? And that would be The Road by Cormac McCarthy, who recently passed away. I just, uh, that book had such an influence on me, um, in terms of the threat of global destruction and, you know, what is at the heart of man? How, how could we survive such devastation? And I think it's so relevant now in this era of extreme climate change, which is not going away anytime soon. Uh, it's scary. It's scary, the climate change that's happening now. And couple that with the wars and you know a lot of political tensions, the threat to democracies. I feel like we're in a very fragile time period in history. And someone like John, uh, like uh, Cormac McCarthy really um, is not afraid to delve into the scary uh, prospects of what could happen to humanity. Right. And I, I think his writing style is so, so candid. He's, he takes you right inside the character, you know, and uh, which is what you do as a writer. Well, the road, you know, the first thing I noticed was that there was hardly any syntax you know, it reminded me kind of like E.E. E. Cummings, a world without syntax, yep. you know, um, and, and and I think it perfectly uh, accompanied or supplemented this kind of idea that in, in a post-apocalyptic world, there are no rules. And, and so he doesn't follow the traditional English grammar rules of you know, where commas and semicolons and hyphens are, are placed, paragraph breaks, uh, quotes around dialogue. He doesn't use any quotes. And in so doing, I think he really kind of gave a stream of consciousness quality to that book that allowed you to, as a reader to really deeply go into the scene and the minds of the character, the main character, without being distracted by the little dots and commas and quotes. Um, right. And I, you know, I know, I think when we take away the rules of grammar and it's another reminder of how fragile that ecosystem is too, our, our language and the value yes. of words and what we do with them, you know? Yes. And, and you can't do it well, unless you know the rules first, you know, you ask any musician, you, you dive off the platform of the traditional into that higher unknown level of the exploration, but you need that platform first, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that applies um, in your, your book about the serial killer? I, I don't think I'll ever write a true crime like that again. It really exhausted me to do. But um, in that, um, you know, I included uh, a lot of actual excerpts from his letters to me. So in those, I, I said in the preface, you know, just to prevent Amazon and Goodreads reviewers saying, this is full of typos. This is full of typos. Um, I did have one person post that this is full of typos. Um, yeah, it is full of typos because his letters were full of mistakes. Uh, and in really funny ways of thinking about things and, and jokes and um, very colorful, dark little segments to his letters. So it was very important for me to capture his voice through his, his writing. And um, the, the, 
the narrative structure I used for that book is because at this time I was writing it, I sent some portions to the an agent to an agent, and I forget the book she told me to read, but it had alternating chapters between the girl's life in the present and the crime that was committed in the past that had nothing to do with her. So um, you might know, but uh, hopefully I can follow up with you and let you know what the name of that book was. But that inspired me to um, not write the book in a linear fashion. Like mm -hmm. I went to the prison, I met with him, he confessed this murder, he confessed that murder. But instead what I did was the opening chapter describes him killing one of his, his first victim and burying her body. And then it breaks. And the second chapter is, I first met the serial killer on, you know, this is how it all came about this book. So I alternate between his crimes, the investigation of his crimes with chapters involving my life and how I got to know him. So I think by playing with that kind of uh, unusual approach to nonfiction, uh, for example, you read an Ann Rule true crime, it's just going to be, he did this, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. Um, I thought it was kind of interesting to play with time. I'm just thinking about what you said about um, his typos and his quirky way of thinking mm -hmm. and yeah. how our, our writing is like a uh, a fingerprint it really yeah is indicative of who we are as as people and i'm i'm just curious about you know your curiosity about what drives people to do dark things yeah. and how do we contain that darkness what what observations did you make mm -hmm. when you were inside his narrative um i think there was uh, you know we always look at the nature versus nurture you know, was it his parents? Was it his childhood? Was it something he was born with? Um, I think it was a mix of both. I think it was a perfect storm. Um, in that book, I talked about his relationship with his mother. Um, because, of course, you know, Freud will say, what about your mother? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, she died of, uh, I believe she died of breast cancer. She was sick for a long time. And then I think she had a stroke. She recovered from the breast cancer and then she had a stroke. I'm little, I haven't, I haven't looked at the book in years. Um, but I think the loss of his mother was a big issue in his life because it happened at a formative age, the age of 11. And it was simultaneously at the same time that he was stealing his parents car and in the middle of the night driving down to Newport News um, to a very seedy part of the city where the prostitutes were and when he was a young teenager gosh I think it was like 13 or 14 he solicited his first sex act from a prostitute and I think it just charged his brain and became like a drug to him and then I think as he felt more powerless in the face of his circumstances with his mother's death, um, you know, he dropped out of school, his girlfriend got pregnant, she left him for another man, he was mowing lawns and living in his van at the time of the crimes. Um, I think he felt very powerless. And I think he turned to this, what we call paraphilia, which is, you know, uh, taking pleasure, sexual pleasure from uh, another person's pain. And so, you know, this is paraphilia, something common to rapists. You know, they, they get off on seeing someone suffer and having that immense power over them. So there was one day when I sat out in my screened in porch and I read, you know, over 200 pages of letters from him that I have kept all day long. I read these letters, trying to think what drove him? What is the ultimate motive? And it was through reading these letters in their entirety that I came upon the realization that it's power, power. 
-hmm. He did not have power in his life. He was very angry that he did not have power. He had, you know, been uh, incarcerated time and time again for minor traffic violations. And once he became a third time offender, it was anything in the future was an automatic felony violation. So I think he just felt like uh, by doing these terrible deeds, it, it gave him a sense of power, not just over this woman and her body, her sexuality by violating her, but killing her. Uh, you know, I think there was just a sense of indestructible you know, I, I'm not the weak person people think I am. So, you know, I do think that we can bring that idea into any situation of evil, you know, like why does Putin do what he does? Mm -hmm. You know, any other person bombing civilian structures, knowing that babies and children and women and elderly are dying, um, shouldn't that keep you up at night? <laughs> I mean, shouldn't, shouldn't you feel sick inside that you have done this? But power is such a, uh, it's a drug. It, it's a drug. And I, and I think there are certain types of people who uh, feed off of it and live for it. It sustains them somehow. And once they get a taste of it, they, they, they want more. You know, it's a, uh, it's a, never-ending hunger it's insatiable right almost parasitic which would yeah yes yes yep i'm yeah. not going to get in i'm not going to get into american politics but i think we see the same you know with leaders throughout the world um or people who want to be leaders you know that that desire it's it, i i've got to hang on to this power and i'll do it at all costs and, and it's often related to an incredible absence of identity and self-esteem, which, you know, any psychologist would tell you that narcissists are empty inside, you know, um, they don't have an inner sense of who they are. They look for it in the outside world. So the more money I make or the more in Bill Howell's case, the more women I rape, um, you know, these things give them a sense of protection and identity. And, uh, you know, on, on that note, just to kind of bring it back to a place of hope, I think, I think what, what you're saying is absolutely what's happening in our world right now. And, you know, why people can, you know, take their money to the bank, even though they've, they've trashed the landscape, for example, um, and making their money, there's that sort of that cognitive dissonance too. And, and the more it's accepted, the more they, the more easy uh, it becomes to shrug it off, you know. Um, but the flip side, I I believe, is the um, people like you and uh, Doriana who who put us put a, put a narrative frame around it and help us make mm -hmm. sense of of that, that and the converse, which is that with a little faith in, and um, belief in the universe, that, that that becomes reciprocated and amazing things become possible. And, um, and, and maybe, maybe that's why victims of war sometimes are, are glorified or simplified as all good people, um, so, that we, so that we can celebrate the survivors as the, the survival of everything that's, that's virtuous. But what does survive is human, human virtue in in the story, and I, th I think too, even with those stories that, that look at a po post-apocalyptic world, it's in the act of writing is a sense of connecting with what is good in us that that's findable and and can be nurtured to keep it from happening. You know, I think that's probably what drove Rachel Carson in the '60s when she was writing and taking a lot of flack. You know that this was we can heal. Right. Um, you know, Adoriana says in Escape from Mariupol at the end, without love, this world would have not survived until now. And I, mean, I believe that so strongly. Um, I believe that of all of our institutions, our families, our friends. I mean, I, I don't think, you know, many people understand the power of, of love. Um, but, you know, 
one, I do believe that one genuinely loving, healing, calm person, someone like Eckhart Tolle, who I love, <laughs> the power of uh, power of now, um, you know, just his being, his energy, his calmness, the peace he conveys. Um, I don't think we really understand. I don't understand, but on an energetic level, the power that that kind of a presence has in our world. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when you look through history, love does always win, you know, love wins. You look at the Holocaust, so dark, um, so horrific. It exemplifies man's evil. And yet you look at all of the beauty and truth that came once all of that was revealed to the world. All of that horror was revealed uh, through the Nuremberg trials and films of the camps. Suddenly, you know, there, there was this huge need to, to, um, to protect the Jewish people, to honor them, um, to, to talk, you know, the greatest Jewish writers will tell you it was love that got them through the experience. You know, it was knowing that they had someone on the other side who was still there that loved them, or it was being there, uh, even just loving yourself, you know, even loving the earth, loving the sun, the land, you know? So, um, yeah, evil does not have, uh, the final say. It doesn't have the final say. And, and I think the greatest triumph is for someone like Doriana, having witnessed that level of evil firsthand, that she still remains a loving, hopeful person to me is the ultimate victory. And it is, it is an inspiration and, and something very significant to hold on to this, this accomplishment mm -hmm. that the two of you share in this, in this mm -hmm. text. We, um, Anne, would you mind reading a selection from your work to just to kind of put your, your literary voice in the conversation? Okay, so would three paragraphs be too much? No, it would be great. Just, okay, okay. So this describes um, one night when uh, the neighboring buildings surrounding the high rise where uh, Adoriana and over 200 civilians were hiding in the basement one of the neighboring buildings was bombed and caught fire and all of the civilians fled the building and some of them fled into the basement where Adoriana and the others were hiding and many of them had uh, potentially lethal or lethal uh, injuries because they did uh, uh, sadly many of these people uh, had to sleep next to corpses in the basement because they couldn't bring the bodies up to bury them it was too dangerous so this describes <clears throat> one night when a neighboring building was bombed and Adoriana and, and others were in the basement. Uh, <clears throat> a man had fled the carnage on a broken foot. The bones were protruding from his flesh. His leg shook uncontrollably as he slipped in and out of consciousness. I was one who kept others from bleeding to death from their wounds. I held my breath and forced myself to pull the blood clots from the man's wounded leg. The rancid odor of those clots disgusted me to the point of nausea. I had never witnessed so much blood. A surge of adrenaline sharpened my mind and gave strength to my hands. I kept saying to myself, just think that this is meat on the counter, Adoriana. It's just meat, just blood, just bones. No, it's not a human being and it does not hurt. In this manner, I was able to use my boot laces as a tourniquet and then bandage up the man's foot and leg. I believe I was meant to take that paramedic course in the autumn of 2021. The experience was not a coincidence. It carried a mystical purpose. I was destined to treat this man. That poor soul was not the only person I treated. I pulled out shards of glass lodged beneath the skin of children and adults. I saw holes in skulls and protruding bones the color of dull ivory. I tried to stop the bleeding by plugging up wounds with any absorbent material I could find. I dressed lesions using improvised means, shirt sleeves, blankets, anything that was available. I also roused people who were losing consciousness. Some of the survivors of that blast had their fingers and limbs blown off. 
It was a terrible night, a night when those of us who were still alive lost all hope that we would survive future attacks. In the street above, the screams of those trapped inside the bombed out shelter reverberated for hours. At some point, what remained of the building caught fire. All of the people pinned down by the mountains of debris perished in a terrible agony. By morning, the screams had gone silent. And you know, when, when uh, it's interesting, I, I wish I could send you the or uh, find the original email i'm sure i can i kept all of the emails i would write the chapter based on her email add some research and fill in the gaps and i would send it to her for her approval so she could translate it and you know when i read this uh, read these paragraphs to you um this these paragraphs involve such a blending of my voice with her voice because for example you know things like um you know the the color of the bones the color of dull ivory i added that because that is what human bones appear as dull ivory so she did not use that description but she said i remember seeing the bones protruding so then i threw a little description so throughout the book I, I often did that where I I kind of play with words a little, add a little description, but in a way that did not take away from the integrity of the story or the facts. Uh, as you were reading, I was remembering my experience of reading the book and, and her shoes mm -hmm. mm. and how they they told their own story and um, right. stayed with her probably longer than she wanted them to, you know? That, yeah, that's why I kind of regret that she got rid of those boots in the Czech Republic when she got there because they represented such bad memories. Because I thought, you know, maybe 30 years from now, she would show those to her grandchildren and say, you see these boots, they still have the blood stains. It would be like a soldier's boots or a Holocaust. You know, that's why in the Holocaust, the, in the concentration camps, the shoes have so much uh, meaning. Shoes are what we use to go through this or to walk, to move forward. They, rep, you know, and, and, our, and they can reflect, you know, what we've been through. And in this case, the shoes were battered and, and blood stained and also smelt horribly of the chemicals and toxins that filled that shelter when it caught fire. It's amazing. You know, my, um, after my mom passed, I brought some of her shoes home and the footbed fits my foot perfectly and I can feel the shape. And it's when you, when you say that about, you know, that this is how we walk the earth, there is, there, there is that. And, and those ordinary things that, um, that, that tell the story. And I think, again, that's one of the strengths of this book are the, the, those images, um, you know, they're, they tap into some archetypal images for a reason. They become arch archetypes because human experience has, has re repeated itself uh, and th those patterns repeat and, and it, they carry such tremendous power, you know, and, uh, and it's, it, it's, it's amazing. And I, I wish you both every success with um, getting it to a larger audience, getting it on the screen um, and, um, and giving people hope and uh, that, that yes, love does prevail and love does conquer, conquer the monster, you know, um, we hope sooner rather than later, you know? Yeah. I mean, look how, look how the hate and the violence has rejuvenated NATO, you know? I mean, a few years ago, if, if you said that NATO would be more unified than ever in accepting new countries like Sweden, and, you know, would unite against this war, a lot of people would, I think, I think Putin wasn't counting on it. I think it took him by surprise too. And um, so in many ways, you know, you look at our country, there's such partisan division and the both extremes, it's like, like it was leading up to the civil war, right? And right, right. yet you look at Ukraine thus far, for the most part, 
I mean, it is our uh, support for Ukraine has joined the political parties up until now. There are some dissenters, but I mean, it has it has unified us. So you you see what happens in the face of this kind of irrational, dangerous attack that the the forces of good join together. Yeah, and may that continue to gain gain strength and 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 bring it to a conclusion soon. And thank you for your for your time um, in this conversation. And I'm going to post in the podcast notes so you have some appearances later in the summer, right? So our listeners can can check out woodburyrights.net, get to those details and get to the links to your, your website and your, and your other books. Thank you so much. That's so kind of you to, to help me in that way. Thank you. Thank you.